come to the churchyard of the two churches of Great Melton, All Saints and St Mary. All Saints is behind me and is the present used church, but to the left you've got the church of St Mary, which fell into ruins finally, not until the late 19th century. account of Norfolk by Noel Coward is that it's very flat but but in fact it's far from that and if you walk up Gas Hill in Norwich or if you're on the hills up above Sheringham one can see that it's much more varied. In fact Norfolk's really a number of separate sensitively different landscapes. The Broads over in the east uh, the Fens in the west, uh, the Breck down in the southwest, and then the varying sorts of coastline from cliff to sand dune around the north and eastern edges. And then in the middle, a pattern of shallow but very interesting river valleys, and they're separated by areas of plateau. Each of these areas has got its own characteristics and each of them has influenced the way that man can live in them as well. What we're going to do in this study is to look at a sample of villages that represent these different areas of the county and look at the way that their characteristics have influenced the way people live. But on top of that there's of course the whole great stretch of human history as well. And as man has evolved and as settlements has evolved, he's used these areas in different ways in different places. For example, the impact of the monasteries was a very important influence up until the 1550s. The building of the railways changed the importance of one place compared with another. The shaping of the field systems and the gradual enclosing of the commons was another big way in which gradually the settlement patterns and the villages changed over time. The arrival of the monastic system had a big impact on Norfolk. For example, village such as Binham, where the Benedictines settled with their uh, servants, the monks, and their agricultural system would have a big impact on what became a little market town for a period because of the importance of the abbey. Elsewhere, the disappearance of the commons was a very important element in the way in which the shape of the agricultural landscape changed and new roads were made, as for example in the parish where we're sitting at Great Melton. Then the railways came and places that got railways, uh, for example, Melton Constable, became important, but many other places that did not get a railway lost out. And then the big new roads, and Heatherset, which is one of the villages studied, shows how being on the main road can have an impact on a village within a few miles of Norwich. And indeed, living within a few miles of Norwich there's the impact of the great um, urban sprawl of Norwich. We'll use Norfolk's geography and the written record, the findings of archaeologists and historic maps, in fact a wide variety of the historians' and geographers' tools to investigate these villages. Hopefully, these are methods you can use to deepen your understanding of your own town or village. One of the places we'll visit frequently during this presentation is the record office in Norwich. So let's go there now. Well, we're in the foyer of the Norfolk Record Office, which is a part of the Norfolk Archives Centre. And it's here that many of the documents are kept. In the, in the entrance corridor to the uh, Record Office, there's invariably a very interesting exhibition on display. And uh, even if you don't want to go in to look at the documents, it's always worth coming in to look at the exhibitions. Uh, the current exhibitions, there are two of them, 
um, R1 to uh, the celebrate 400 years since the birth of Sir Thomas Brown, who spent much of his life in Norwich, was a famous doctor, but also a famous polymath, writing on many other issues as well. Further along the corridor, we've got an exhibition um, because we're in the um, 200 years since Trafalgar, uh, a big exhibition on Nelson and the documents to do with his life in Norfolk. All you need to do is to come into the reception desk and the receptionist will ask a few details about what you're trying to do and then they'll issue you with a card. It can be a temporary one for a day but it's much more sensible to get a permanent card at no cost and then you can show that each time you come into the record office. The archivist will help you with the complicated problem of where to find the documents you're interested in and there's a, a supply of uh, calendars and registers and indexes which they will guide you through in order for you to submit on a small slip of paper exactly what you want. There is a half hourly service and there are also computer points and there's microfilms and microfiche where many of the documents in fact uh, should be read rather than in the original because of course some of them are priceless and they're much better preserved if they can be kept on film uh, rather than being handled regularly. We're starting our journey on the coast at Hunstanton, or to use the name it has on the maps today, Old Hunstanton, with some help from the record office. I've made particular use of the Lestrange documents for their Hunstanton estate and their account books provide a priceless picture of the 17th century um, in that part of Norfolk. Here at the west end of the county we can see exposed in the cliffs the chalk raft on which Norfolk sits, the white chalk, the red chalk and then the cast stone below they are clearly seen. On top of these is a thin layer of debris from the last ice age, though not as deep here as the glacial boulder clay that covers the rest of Norfolk. We're also in a part of northwest Norfolk long inhabited by man, evidenced by the many finds that have been discovered all over this area, from fragments of pottery to hordes of coins. The cast stone is the orangey-brown, rather crumbly sandstone that gives a distinctive colour to many buildings from Hunstanton southward, right down to Sandy in Bedfordshire. The local landowners for much of the period of written history were the Lestrange family. A remarkable series of bailiff's account books for the manors has survived. Let's look at one of the documents at the record office from this collection. For six pounds of rice, two shillings and sixpence. For six pounds of figs, one shilling and ninepence. For two pounds of verdant almonds, two shillings and fourpence. Sent from my father, a dozen of larks and a salmon pie. For apples, fourpence. For eggs, Ten pence. Today, when you get home from the supermarket, you can check what you've purchased on the receipt and then comment on the diet and living expenses in the household for which you're buying. In the same way, these account books in the record office open up the cost of living and the lifestyle of the Lestrange family in the early 1600s. The next village or in fact villages, that we'll call at are the Terringtons, St John and St Clement, stretching for nine and a half miles from the southern edges of the Wash, southwards across the silt lands of marshland to the peaty soils of the Smeath. Over the centuries, the parish has extended itself northwards, gaining land from the sea, and then the Fenland peats have shrunk, increasing the dangers of flooding. 
the magnificent church at Terrington St Clement tells us of real wealth for this manor, part of the holdings of the great monastery of Ely. The battle with the sea is exemplified by the study of documents and maps relating to the building of sea defences, and a walk across these defences gives some idea of the scale of the work involved. The ability to push back the sea gave the opportunity to control it, to allow it to flood part of the land and then shut it off, with the resultant evaporation of salt pans creating that essential preservative for medieval times, salt. From the ancient Roman banks to the defences of the early 20th century, the gradual enlargement of the village can be followed. And a climb to the top of the final bank reveals the wash with views across to King's Lynn and Skegness. Before we leave the Terringtons, we'll mention a couple of documents at the record office. Finding a will and an inventory for the same person is always a bonus, and Richard Cooper of Terrington left both. He describes himself as a husbandman, so we would normally expect him to be a man of modest means. However, he left an inventory valued as £126, 5 shillings and 4 pence, including cattle and horses worth £35 and sheep to the value of £46. His wife Ellen was to receive, amongst other things, 20 weathers, the 20 best ewes and lambs and various other livestock. Together with the listing of the produce from his land and his house itself, this snapshot in time of a late 16th century Fenland farmer gives us a picture of the prosperity in the Terringtons as land use was claimed back from the marshes. We'll move now down through the county to the Brex and call at the village of Wheating as our exemplar. Archaeology has shown that ancient cultures from Mesolithic, Neolithic and Bronze Age times existed in this area, in particular the flint mines known as Grimes Graves. The parish of Wheating with Broomhill grew up near one of Breckland's few small streams. Arable lands lay around the settlement with several thousand of acres of heath from the north field to the parish boundary. The land was once covered by oak forest but after this was cleared in the Bronze Age, the thin and sandy soils became heathland, breckland. A breck is an area of land that is, or was, broken up at irregular intervals for cropping. The poor soils were grazed and manured by sheep and rabbits, and crops could then be grown. And then the land left fallow again for several years. It was perhaps because of the poverty of the land that Sir Henry de Play founded a priory at Broom Hill, a short distance from his manor house at Wheating. The fortified manor house of the Play family is today known as Wheating Castle and it stands close to the church of St Mary. The longest single thatched roof in England, the former estate cottages at Wheating, remind us that the village also illustrates changes caused by the establishment of a great estate. But we will look at those factors in greater detail when we arrive back at Melton. We move now to Broadland, where the village of Hickling is famous for its nature reserve. Faden's map of 1797 shows that Hickling then had three broads. It's a classic broadland settlement with open water, reed and sedge marshes, alder car, drainage dikes and former wind pumps, together with tongues of high quality brick earth soils between the marshy surrounds. Flooding has been a problem over the centuries. Faden's map shows former breaches along this stretch of the coast. 
The nucleus of the village is around the church. There is a somewhat sinuous settlement on what was Hickling Green and a smaller cluster of buildings at Hickling Heath, which reaches the stave, the quayside, or point of access to the water. As with any typical Broads village, Hickling developed a dual economy, based on marsh and agriculture. The will of yeoman farmer Robert Cock, made in 1646, is typical of the type of evidence we can use to understand how land was owned and passed on at that time. He was a man of some importance, leaving four small estates, one to his wife and three, it seems, to his three daughters and their husbands. He left his grandchild a close of 14 acres, and his bequests of at least two marshes make it clear that not all marshland was in common ownership by 1646. We now, of course, know that the digging of peat formed the broads. It was the combined evidence of geological interpretation and documentary research that helped us to that understanding just 60 years ago. To represent the river valleys, we next visit the villages of Brampton and Borough next Aylsham. The modern river Bure meanders across a wide flood plain after rising near Melton Constable on the back of the Cromer Holt Ridge. Pairs of parishes often straddle Norfolk River valleys, and Brampton and Borough do so just downstream of Aylsham. In this particularly beautiful spot, cattle-rich meadows survive between the arable slopes on either side of the valley. Two stories emerge from the two villages. As we begin to study Brampton, we find that it conceals the site of an important Roman town and pottery making centre. Sir Thomas Brown, who we last met in the exhibition at the record office, wrote in 1667 of urns found at Brampton. In more recent times, Dr A.K. Knowles led the study group that would go on to discover 141 pottery kilns from Roman times, to the west of Brampton. Excavations continued to find a defended Roman town at the junction of two Roman roads, one from the Fens, probably on to Caister by Yarmouth, and the other from Caister by Norwich, then to Isinorum, through Stratton Strawless and then probably on to the North Norfolk coast. Brampton's importance in Roman Britain was an early example of the way in which many Norfolk villages have been linked to much wider national and European patterns of activity. Across the Bure Valley lies Borough Church, with a striking early English chancel when viewed from the outside. Inside it is stunning. While we must be aware of the restoration work by R. M. Phipson, with suggestions from Gilbert Scott, the beautiful Gothic arcade and the eight lancet windows above it date from between 1220 and 1230. On the river itself stands the mill, and below it is one of the locks built to enable wherries to travel from Yarmouth up the Bure to Aylsham. The Great Flood of 1912 destroyed all the locks on this navigation and ended the attempts to make better use of the rivers Bure and Ant. Whilst Borborough also represents life in a Norfolk River valley, it is unusual in that the one parish stretches right across the valley. The floor of the River Yare is wide and flat at this point, and flooding in 1987 recreated a lake around the mill. There is certainly evidence in the parish of Tumuli from Bronze Age times, and a mill is recorded at Borborough in the Doomsday Book. The surviving water mill is a classic example of continuity and change. The site is almost certainly that on which the Doomsday Mill was built, once a breaker slope is established, mill pools banked and overflow channels cut, the site of a mill becomes fixed. 
Barbara also represents for us the conundrum we have in trying to sort out history and legend. St Walston was one of the East Anglian saints, and a shrine to him arose at Barbara. A spring to the north of the church, according to legend, burst forth when he was brought on his final journey back to the village. The rectory of Barbara was linked to the Cathedral Priory in Norwich in 1240, and benefited from that connection until Henry VIII's dissolution of priories and monasteries, and the shrine at Barbara was destroyed. It could just be that when we look at some of the building north of the bridge at Barbara, we see limestone blocks which were once part of the shrine. Barbara today retains its individuality as two attractive riverside settlements linked by a bridge, a church and a mill, with the former shrine of St Walston standing high on the south bank of the river at the western limit of the settlement. Staying with the river valleys, we move south to Shotsham. Norfolk generally lacks clearly defined physical units, but the small valley of the River Tass is an exception to that rule. The four parishes of All Saints, St Mary, St Martin and St Botolph were the administrative units from Doomsday in 1086 until the Poor Law Unions were created in 1834. All Saints Church stands today high above the beck. There is clear evidence of Roman roads and settlement, and the word Ham at the end of the name indicates that a Saxon group settled here about 500 or 600 AD. Why did the first settlers choose to live here? The site of All Saints Church dominating the valley of the beck is an obvious location for such an early settlement, with water, meadow and drained hillside. The story of the other three Shotshams is quite complicated and there are lots of questions. Unravelling the information about them in Doomsday Book is difficult. The village evidently split into four, had four churches, and then from the time of the Black Death gradually came back into being one parish again. From the River Valley settlements, we now go to a plateau village, Wacton, in the hundred of Depwade. We can't be sure what a hundred was. Maybe it provided a hundred fighting men. Maybe it held one hundred hides, twelve thousand acres of land. The great common at Wacton has a striking appearance of openness that we are not greatly used to today, but it may well have been woodland until late medieval times. It seems likely that the area, not far from Venter Isinorum, was familiar to the Romans, but after their time returned to woodland. The local place names suggest it was in Saxon and Danish Viking times that it was settled again. Certainly fieldwork has shown that this wooded pasture landscape was well settled in medieval times. One of the joys of studying Wacton itself is the unusual tithe survey taken in 1541, a document produced to make sure who paid tithes to All Saints Church and who paid tithes to St Mary's. In doing so, it describes each piece of land, names each tenant, gives the manner to which it belongs, gives its acreage and the name of the field within which it lies, a very modern database. The parish also provides a surviving building which can be again tied together with a will. John Sherman of Wacton died in 1597. His bequest to his wife gives a vivid picture of part of a prosperous household. Item. I give and bequeath unto my said wife the bed whereon she now lieth, fully furnished as it now standeth in her own chamber and the best bed, furnished as it now standeth in the new parlour chamber, and also the occupation of the press there standing, and after her decease, I will that the same press shall be and remain unto Timothy my son. Another very useful document from Wacton 
is an inventory or list of the goods of George Rains. In total, he had goods valued at £78, 8 shillings and threepence. His cattle are recorded, as is his corn. The chamber over the buttery contains... Two boards and one square piece of timber, six pence. Four sacks, two shillings. One woollen wheel, twelve pence. One pair of stock cards, twelve pence. One pair of wool cards, six pence. Two stone of hemp, six shillings. Three stamping beetles, two pence. We move on now to consider the impact of man in shaping the county we know today. North to the valley of the River Stifke, where the ruins of the Benedictine Priory dominate the skyline north of the village of Binham. Binham is a small village which was formerly a market town concentrated around a triangular market place. The village has an attractive mix of cottages and some more imposing buildings. Some of the older buildings have used bits of stone that were once part of the Priory. A prosperous 17th century house stands at the south end of the marketplace. But outside the village stand the remains of the Benedictine Priory, which was to influence the village in many ways. Peter de Valoyne, a cousin of William the Conqueror, and his wife Albreda, established the Benedictines here in 1093. The Priory West Front is the earliest example of early English architecture in the country. The King granted a market to Binham and it received tithes from 21 Norfolk villages. The market made it into an economic centre. Butchers, fish merchants, stonemasons and many other traders sold their goods and skills to the monks and their lay population. Whilst the Priory ceased to function from the time of the dissolution, it provided the building which is now the parish church. Because a map of 1655 is available for Binham, we can use it to see the stream dividing the parish, the position of the valuable meadowland, Northfield and Westfield occupy large areas, and it's not until enclosure in 1814 that the hallmarks of Binham's open field system disappear. The Mattishalls. Mattishall itself and Mattishall Borough lie very near the centre of Norfolk on the Boulder Clay Plateau between the rivers Yare and Wensum. The two churches dominate the plateau landscape. Much of the story of the village centres on its links with the University of Cambridge. It was in 1370 that Edmund Gonville, a Norfolk man, endowed his new foundation of Gonville Hall with the income of the Church of Mattishall All Saints. The parishioners would pay their tithes, one-tenth of their income, in goods or produce or money, to the church, and this then went on to help with the costs of the new college. In return, Gonville Hall had to maintain a vicar to look after the church and he received a small element of the income to look after himself. Mattishall's other claim to fame was through wool. The Norwich Mayor's court books make it clear that a group of prosperous wool dealers, or broggers as they were known, based themselves in that central Norfolk position at Mattishall. They were avoiding the Norwich wool market and its taxes and had a thriving trade across the county and into Suffolk. The court books and wills from some of the men of Mattishall show just how important the trade was to the village and for the upkeep of the church. Today, the town sign recalls the importance of wool to the village. We'll go to the village of Corston to understand how in Tudor times the yeomen of Norfolk rose in stature. Michael de la Pole, Earl of Suffolk, was Lord of the Manor from 1385. 
the rebuilding of Causton Church is attributed to him and his successors. No flint tower for this church. Stone brought from Caen in France was to be used to face the tower. The rich range of wills and maps of Causton bring the lives of the yeoman farmers to life. Such men as Robert Machian and John Reeve can be traced and understood through the documents that they left. From 1540, instead of leaving money to the religious guilds, people began to leave money to the poor. So the documentary evidence also helps us picture the lives of the poor, though they never wrote for themselves. In 1559, uh, Stephen Parson, a worsted weaver, specified, Jane, my wife, shall give unto the poor people at my burial day one dozen bread and a firkin beer. Later, Ralph Stanhor Gent would specify, Item, I give unto the poor people of Causton ten shillings. Item, I give unto the poor people of Brandiston five shillings. Soon afterwards, the parish formally took on responsibility for the poor through a poor rate and an overseer. One of the parish papers provides some very interesting material. The names of such as live by their hand labour with their children to be employed in work in Alvington Street to Eastgate. The parish of Worstead is 2,600 acres. It lies on the west bank of the River Ant, stretching inland onto the plateau. It's of course best known for its assumed link with Worstead cloth. Understanding the village is greatly helped because a number of important maps have survived. The Church Commissioner's map of 1781 is a copy of a map of 1600, so a visit to the record office takes us back to that year. We can use it to reconstruct the medieval open field system of the parish. We can see that the plan of the main village is much the same as the present village core. There are four hamlets of Worstead, Brigate, Bengate, Lingate and Withergate. The word gate used to mean road. Perhaps they grew on the outer edges of the common fields, as population expanded before the time of the Black Death. We must content ourselves with two other features of Worstead. One is to use it to represent the growth of nonconformity in Norfolk. The Baptist established a spread of chapels in East Norfolk by 1851, and then the particular Baptists, following the teaching of John Calvin, built their own churches. The Worcester Baptists established their church of 120 members with a chapel and graveyard close to the present chapel at Meeting Hill. The records of that first church give us a picture of the problems and challenges they faced. Disciplining members who strayed from the expected behaviour and commissioning others to go out further afield as preachers. The other feature of Worcester to mention is that rare Norfolk occurrence, a canal. A water mill is recorded at Brigate from the time of Doomsday, 1086. The hamlet grew when the North Walsham to Dillon Canal was built to make waterborne transport easier from the rivers up to North Walsham. The farms and many small businesses along the canal gained benefit over a number of decades. But the coming of the railways began to take away trade and damage caused by the Great Flood of 1912 finished off the viability of the waterway. And so we moved back across the county to where we began, the estate village of Great Melton. Six miles to the west of Norwich, it is a small parish with two churches in the same churchyard. 
they lie to the east of an attractive park where once stood Melton Hall. The history of the area goes back a long way. An important excavation illustrated that in Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age times, a flintwork factory existed there. The Romans and the Saxons were also active in the area. The wall of the Church of All Saints shows the outline of a Saxon door, and the stonework contains Roman tiles. Viewed from the air, we can see the other striking feature of Melton, the road pattern around the estate. The roadway which once went through the estate was closed to the public in 1776, and the straight roads which form a pentagon around the estate indicate the planning that went into the layout. Such wholesale movement of both roads and houses was not uncommon across Norfolk and the rest of the country, as the wealthy landowners of the 18th and 19th centuries sought to make their mark through their ostentatious parks and gardens. Today the mature trees inside the park give us some feeling of how it once looked, though a fire burnt down Great Melton Hall in 1900 and left the park with no central point. Our last point of call is at Heatherset, now a large village lying on the Boulder Clay Plateau, four miles to the southwest of Norwich. Most people now go round the village on what is now the A11, but over 5,000 people live in this large satellite of Norwich. It first became a desirable place for those who had made money in Norwich to come and live three or four centuries ago. Several of the city's mayors became resident in Heatherset, men such as Thomas Lear, Roger Ramsay and Roger Bean. I wonder if Roger Bean, who owned the Thickthorn estate at Heatherset in 1710, would recognise much of it now, as much of the land has disappeared under the major road interchange on the Norwich Southern Bypass. In many ways, Heatherset's story is one of movement by road. From ancient times, the road has run from Norwich to Thetford and then on to London. It was in the last decade of the 1600s that the first attempts were made to relieve the pressure of traffic on this road with the building of the first Norfolk Turnpike between Wyndham and Attleborough. The pump, now moved to be near the village sign, is the one reminder of the days of the turnpike when it provided water to lay the dust on the roadway and refreshment for the horses of the coaches. More Acts of Parliament followed to deal with the state of the road between Heatherset and Fettle Bridge, and the tolls set for Kringleford in 1839 give us an idea of the cost of using the road. Narrow wheels did most damage, so they paid most. For every cart, drawn by two or three horse, with wheels of less breadth than four and a half inches, fourpence halfpenny. The same with wheels of six inches or more in breadth, drawn by not more than four horses, three pence. The parish church, three inns and several good houses lined the turnpike. The records show continual tinkering and development of the road through to the first modern bypass in 1963 and then the development of the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st have spawned a petrol station, service area, motel and restaurant, with doubtless more to come. And so we complete the round of places that we have chosen to exemplify the villages of Norfolk and show some of the contexts we consider when studying our own settlements and some of the methods we use. The book associated with this presentation Exploring the Norfolk Village, the eighth title and the Norfolk Origin series can take you much further than we have had time to consider here and will point you to the sources we have used. The great interest that has come about in studying our own families and their background, largely stimulated by the sorts of technology being used to bring this presentation to you, is just at its beginning. The makers of this video, Popland Publishing, operate a website at www.poppyland.co.uk 
that will provide more sources and tools to help you explore East Anglian history and gives links to other useful local services. On the DVD version, you'll also find a folder which you can access on your computer, providing other useful links and resources. Mm -hmm.